Welcome back to the Mediocre Alaska Podcast. I have the bearded huntsman Dallin Hanchett back to talk about, uh, to recap, his uh, Kodiak mountain goat hunt that we talked about in episode 233. Thanks for being back on here, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited uh, to get the chat about this hunt. Yeah, so the last time we uh, we talked, we were talking about the goat population. We were talking about you're excited and you'd been uh, you've been on a lot of great Alaska hunts while you've been here. So, just as like an appetizer um, before we really get into it, where does this one rank? Oh man, this one. <sighs> as far as everything that I've done since being in Alaska, number one for sure. <laughs> you know, it was just this was like almost like a pinnacle of everything that I've done going into this one hunt you know big mountain hunt alaska you know things that you dream of as a kid and even as an adult a lot of people won't ever get to do this and it's just like a culmination of everything i'd have to say probably number one pretty close to my my elk's probably pretty close that i was able to go take in utah a couple years ago but this was surreal you know kodiak is a beautiful place and holy crap those are some crazy places that these animals live in (laughs) yeah that's sweet uh so a little bit of background here uh, from the Department of uh, Fish and Game website, uh, the original goats were put on there in uh, nineteen in the fifties, and there was eleven female, seven male. There were twenty six goats in nineteen sixty four, and uh, thirty two hundred in the late sixties. So, oh no. Wait, first uh, season was authorized nineteen sixty eight when permits have been in, and and pig- permits have been issued since then currently estimate the goat population on kodiak at about 3200 goats yeah wow. that's pretty that's sweet a, that's a long ways from from what would you say 26 or yeah uh, uh seven uh, 18 originally put on there and then uh 26 okay. in 1964 wow. but uh yeah that's that's cool. awesome and then there is a permit or there's a draw hunt there and they get about 5500 applications for those draw ones but you did a harvest ticket one which is nice. Yeah, yeah. So that, that other hunt, um, I was talking to the, the pilot. It's a, more of a road system hunt there that all the locals try to put in for, is yeah. what he was telling me. Yeah, those easy ones are, it's nice that you have that uh, ability to hunt something fairly easy, but if you didn't have a permit or didn't have it a draw, then, I mean, you would you would not have numbers that would be uh, that would be lasting. So it would be definitely yeah, a, not sustainable. Yeah, you'd, you'd, you'd take, the, take care of them pretty quick. So, um, Compared to what you had scouted and what you thought things would be when you first arrived there and got to the mountain, how was it? Was it the same? Was it different? Like uh, how different was uh, that compared to your expectations? I mean, it, uh, as far as looking at Google Earth and when we hit the ground, you know, it, it definitely looks pretty pretty similar. But um, it, it it all you know the the crap hits the fan as soon as your your boots touch the. <laughs> touch the ground it's like holy crap this is like actually happening um as we were flying in 300 yards from camp uh i've got a little bit of a video on my phone of just you know video and as we're coming in all of a sudden i zoom in on this big old boar grizzly or brown bear just 300 yards from where we're setting up base camp and Perfect. um you know <laughs> as far as the topography and stuff steep where the, the pilot made a joke as he's dropping us in because a, a, a buddy had suggested the spot for me and he made the joke of how good of a friend was this <laughs> because of how steep and, and brushy it kind of was getting up there, but uh, pretty close to what we'd scouted. Um, I, I didn't go in completely blind. I had asked, asked my, my buddy a couple spots, you know, how, how should we go up? You know, he dropped me some, some lines. He said, stick to this. Other spots might look easier on Google Earth, but trust me, it's not, this is the, it's not easy by any means, but this is the easiest way. So we kind of stuck to that, but steep 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 yeah did you go with crampons uh we we had some spikes um okay. but we actually never ended up breaking them out yeah some those those we things are, have, but we didn't. are 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 super great on the, a lot of that slick stuff but then if it's so wet and so kind of chunky the whole thing can give away and sometimes you can kind of catch mm-hmm. your ankle and whatnot so was it was it fairly dry or was it wet but not slick so yeah, when we when we were initially going up from base camp, so we, we we got in late. We were we were a day delayed from Anchorage to Kodiak due to winds, and of course. it actually throws ash in the air. So 
didn't make it on time, but we got out same day that we planned on flying, just about eight hours late. We weren't able to get up that night, so we, we threw base camp, um, woke up the next morning, and we had a just just beautiful, beautiful day getting up. Um, hadn't really rained the day before, so nothing was really too slick. Um, there's these uh, corn stalk looking, I don't know what they were called, but it looked like corn stalks. Those things were all wet, and they were as slick as snot, so those were fun to bust brush through, but once we actually got up out of the brush and stuff, it was it was good. Good. We're, uh, we're moving slow because we had some heavy packs, but um, no, nothing too, too crazy other than just the steep and making sure that you don't push it too hard because there's only one way and it's down. <laughs> yeah. What elevation were you at? Um, so let me actually, I'm just pull out my pens real quick. We'll see what our base camp was sitting at. Um, we were, so we started off, I think, base camp starts off at like 300 feet i think is what base camp started off at and then our spike camp was sitting at what's it saying here well it's showing me as an elevation of zero which is which is not correct <laughs> um but let's see it's no, not to yeah i don't know but um we, we were sitting as far as when we were when we were doing some scouting, we were planning on um, sticking up around um, like twenty seven hundred. I think that's about where we camped out. Um, getting to the tops of the peak, we'd get upwards of um, like thirty or thirty one hundred or so, uh, twenty nine hundred feet. Um, so, so from about three hundred feet, I think was base camp. So we we did we did some decent climbing um, in not a lot of distance as the crow flies. Mm -hmm. What were we doing uh, tent wise? Because being up there in October is way different than being up there in August for, for blacktail and whatnot. So were you going, um, as late as you could because you were, uh, hiking up so, so high, or did you, uh, sacrifice a little bit of weight to get some heavier stuff because it would be better in the conditions? So we did go for, for comfort over, uh, comfort of carrying comfort of sleeping. We had two tents, um, that we took up cause there's three of us. Uh, little did we know we never used that other tent for sleeping it was for uh trying to keep some gear dry or, mm. or hanging um hanging uh we actually put some meat in there to um, just keep it out of, of weather and whatnot so we could keep hunting but um we went with a three-person and a two-person tent and we all just bundled up into that three-person which i think helped with uh, uh staying warm uh the tents was nice and warm we almost didn't want to get out in the mornings but we went oh, yeah. with two tents we even we even packed a bear fence up um don't know if that was necessary, but we did more for the, we called it a false sense of security because I think a pair is getting through those if they want to. But, yeah. Uh, we, we did go a little heavy up. Uh, next time I do it, definitely going to try to lighten up like my rifle and some stuff uh, next time. Yeah. Yeah. So how, uh, like cold was it? Were you getting, uh, pretty close to, to freezing overnight or was it, um, uh, not so bad? So first night when we base camped and in the, in the big tent, it was cold. It was really cold. We woke up to ice and frost all over our tent, all over our sleeping bags. Uh, we didn't get much sleep that night. And then once we, we busted up top to spike camp, um, you know, it was chilly, but it, but it, was, it wasn't too bad. We, we had the right, right gear, right base layering and, and, and t the tent was very insulative. We had good, good, good bags. You didn't want to wake up in the morning because you could tell it was going to be cold and you're going to have to slide into wet clothes. But other than that, you know, it wasn't too bad. Our, our, our layering systems really helped. Um, even though we were wet, we got wet. We were still able to retain, retain heat and wasn't too miserable. You still were just ready to get into your sleeping bag at the end of the night though and get out of some wet clothes. Yeah. Well, how do you handle that? How do you deal with, with being wet and then you might have a dry set of stuff to sleep in, but then the next morning you got to get into wet and it's been cold cause you haven't been wearing it. Uh, do you put uh, like hand warmers in certain spots to maybe kind of dry something out or what's your strategy for not dreading that so much, or at least maybe trying to, to get it somewhat dry. Just make a mental note in your head that it's going to not be that cold. And then when you get shocked into the cold, it's just, you just deal with it. <laughs> we didn't really have any, any uh, foolproof things. You know, we had our, our dry clothes that I kept in a dry bag in the tent. So that no matter what, I would have a clean pair of socks, a clean beanie, and clean clean uh, clothes to sleep in. Um, and those were kind of like the heaven send of at night. You'd hop into those, and you wake up in the morning, and we were late getting up every morning because we were all just trying to talk ourselves to getting into wet boots. 
oh, and yeah. putting on wet, wet gear and it was kind of just a mind over matter thing you know as soon as we got out we started getting warm we were still wet but yeah, i insulated really well and we got moving and we'd find that we'd start stripping layers and, and we were actually running really thin layers and it was still still fairly cold outside but we were doing a lot of moving yeah it makes a big difference when you have a little bit of sun come out so you can get it maybe a little bit oh. of ev- evaporation it just feels we, so much better we were sucking that up whenever we could <laughs> yeah nice all right, so uh, to the hunt stuff, we talked about the gear, talked about elevation and whatnot. So how did the how did the thing unravel or unfold? Yeah, so I should we, say Un- unravel has kind of a bad connotation. So how did it <laughs> unfold? Yeah, so we next morning, so back up base camp, we we ended up hiking up. It took us a while to get up. Um, two guys that I went with were a lot better shaped than me, so they were waiting on me a lot of the time. But it was it was it was slow and grueling getting up. Um, there's some cliffy spots that we had to make sure that all three of us were together, making sure that we could get up nothing too crazy, but enough that you don't just let the one guy do it by himself if he needs help. Um, And then we got up to the top and we found a a relatively flat spot that we wanted to spike. We threw up spike camp and um, right out of, I've got a video as they're setting up a tent. I I'm looking up and we've got three or four goats just skylined probably 700 yards away from us. Um, So we hurry and just put up a, uh, spike because we knew that there was going to be a storm rolling in that night. Um, so we just wanted to have it ready so that we didn't maybe go get a goat down, have to come back, set up a tent. So we got that all up and then we wanted to try to get on the back side of them. Cause they, they, they'd seen us. They were, they were watching us set up the tent the whole time. And, um, we ended up going backtracking just a little bit to get up on top, um, of the spine to be at level, level elevation with them and then walk around. But, you know, long story short, we got up to the top. You look at that backside, and that backside does not look like the front side. It is nothing but snarls, and jags, mm. crags, and all that. Just cliff, cliff, cliff. There was no way of walking behind. So we kind of – we were getting late in the day. We kind of made a game plan of let's just get back down to spike camp. Let's not worry too much about it. We don't want to bump these these goats out. And we made it back down to spike camp, and we're, we're just getting everything, you know, buckled down and – I pop out the spotter and I see one goat that's feeding down quite a ways. And we ended up putting the range finder on it, ranged another point and figured out how far away it was going to be. And it was, we're looking at each other. We got about a half hour left of light. Do we want to bust over there? It was only 400 yards, but only 400 yards seems like a little bit until you're in that country. And it mm-hmm. takes a half hour to go 200 yards. Yeah. Um, so we dropped packs, just went with two rifles and we busted over there to, um, to get into position and we were we were we were fighting light. We wanted to be fast, but we didn't want to bump them. We were just going to back out if we were going to bump them. And we ended up getting into a position where I had about a three hundred yard shot. Um, we were lined up on my goat and um, put two shots down on it, and it rolled about three hundred yards back down towards us. So, um, you know, beautiful. Uh, ended up shooting a nanny. Beautiful, beautiful nanny. Um, we thought it might've been a young Billy at first. Uh, we didn't really give us enough time to really glass it. It's kind of, we got to go now or we don't have the time either way. Uh, I was punching my tag on that goat if I could. And, uh, <laughs> holy cow, just this the surrealness that it was when I realized what had just happened, uh, from just going from camp to getting into shooting position, shooting a goat, and then just watching it, you know, lay in there, just, waiting for the other guy to get back from camp because we didn't walk up until he was there just kind of soaking in the moment and holy cow that was something else hmm. that's awesome uh and just to clarify too there are certain areas where it's recommended to shoot a billy um and in this particular area because the population is flourishing like it is they're as long as you don't shoot it with a kid, you're totally fine taking a nanny or a billy. And you don't, it's not one of those areas where you even have to take a an identification quiz, right? Nope, nope. You can you can take so you've got the two tags. You can take two nannies or one na- one nanny and one billy. You're you're limited on the billy, but both tags can be filled on a nanny. They do encourage it, which was kind of why um, wasn't too worried if if it was a nanny. We knew it was either a nanny or a young billy. Even until walking up to it, I thought it might still be a young Billy until we rolled it over. But it was, you know, I was I, I was happy. I was punching my tag on that one of my tags on that. Regardless, first day kind of kind of felt a little spoiled that we didn't work for it hard enough. But with the next couple of days trying to find a Billy, we 
we definitely earned our keep. Yeah. Yeah, and it's an important thing to to realize too is because Alaska is such a vast state, you might be shooting or you might be hunting the same species, but based on where it's at, the harvest might be considerably different and the what they're mm-hmm. the the how it's being run is is going to be different. So uh that's it's it's pretty sweet that there's that opportunity again that the that the habitat's been great and the population is what it is, so you don't have to worry so much about that or um, and the fact that you can take two nannies really just speaks to the fact that it's been managed well up to this point. So that's great. Oh man, we saw quite a few goats in the little range that we were in, you know, not until last day did we confirm that we actually saw a billy just due to, we were able to glass it and see its urination posture and it, and it, and it peed like a billy. Um, but I mean, if I had to put my, I had a guess on it, we saw 20 to 30 different goats while we were up there. Just hmm. It was mostly nannies. And so it was just a lot of hunting, putting a lot of eyes on a lot of goats and just trying to, trying to filter out what was what, um, I, I, I opted to that, you know, after I shot that, that goat, that if I don't see a Billy, I'm okay eating another tag. Um, where the other guy was like, man, you should just shoot, you should just shoot another nanny. You know, you had the opportunity, you know, just shoot another goat. But that, that was a big moment for me. Cause usually in the past I've been, a opportunistic as soon as i get a shot at something you know take the shot if you want to be successful but um you know unfortunately i didn't end up getting on a billy until we saw him one on that last day but we had trips back down the mountain and come back up and was on the other mountain range that would have required us uh an extra day or two to shoot it and go get it mm-hmm. but so, holy cow it, <laughs> yeah so yeah you you get that done and you walk up on it like do you feel like what's going on in your head yeah, I was kind of trying to think in the moment, like, what am, what am I feeling right now? You know, it was just, there's so much going on. Like, it was it was a lot of shock that, holy cow, I, I was just able to take a mountain goat, something that I, you know, potentially didn't think I'd ever get to do or a well, once-in-a-lifetime thing, you know, pull it in a lower 48 state. You're 25-plus years in a lot of states to pull the tag, and I haven't been putting in. And it kind of all just hit me of, I just got to do something that a lot of people want to do that I've wanted to do for a very long time. And I I could not stop smiling. Like (laughs) there was just like a permanent grin on my face until I got into that sleeping bag that night. After years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by big wireless providers, if we've learned anything, it's that there's always a catch. So when I first heard that Mint Mobile offers premium wireless starting at just 15 bucks a month, I thought, what's the catch? But after talking to them and using their service, it all made sense. There isn't one. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they're the first company to sell wireless service online only. They cut out the cost of retail stores and pass those sweet savings directly to you. For anyone who hates their phone bill, Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month. I was hesitant about having to get a new phone and a new phone number, but with Mint, you can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone and your same phone number along with all of your existing contacts. Mint Mobile gives you the best rate whether you're buying for one or for a family, and at Mint, families start at two lines. All plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and to get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com/waypoint. That is mintmobile.com/waypoint. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com/waypoint. Hmm. Do you think it's uh if it would have been the first thing you got when uh, when you came up here, when you moved up to Alaska, became an official resident, you think that would have changed things at all? Or do you think this is like the so. perfect culmination where everything kind of stacks up? It, things are so different, you can't really compare experiences. You know, people always ask, what's the best game fish? Or, you know, what do you like better, catching a, a trout on a fly or a king salmon? It's like you can't compare. Like a trout on a dry fly is so awesome to see it come up. But yeah, it's it's you know twenty inches compared to twenty, thirty, forty, fifty pounds. So mm-hmm. was um, so it, it was just as 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 different as new as unbelievable as uh, you thought it would be. It it really was. I mean, and not, and not to be stereotypical of oh my gosh, this was amazing. You know, 
but, but that but that's what that's how it was you know as in unfamiliar territory i'm on kodiak island something i've always dreamed of just going to visit let alone hunting you know you're looking over there's just mountains everywhere we had seen within the first 24 hours i think we put eyes on 26 different brown bears um you know just tons of bears in the area and just it wasn't even just shooting the goat it was the whole experience up to that point and, and it may have been a little bit sweeter where I've already gotten to experience a little bit of Alaska. And then I get to just see a completely different side of it because it was, it was very different from Southeast. Oh, yeah. Um, it w- it was, had a little bit of the back West feel of like Utah, Idaho, but then it's got just that Alaska to it still like brown bears up in the Alpine with us. Hmm. Um, you know, every single day that we were there, we saw at least one brown bear within 300 yards of us. We would pass huge huge paw prints in the snows that snow that was on top of the mountain. And it was just like the whole experience, you know, obviously the, the goal was to, was to take that goat. And that was really when, when it all hit me, but just every second was a different experience. And I, I was actually talking to a guy on Instagram that just got back from, from Kodiak that I know from Utah. And he, he went um, hunting blacktails and he posted on Instagram. He says it, it's still so weird that I was so immersed into this atmosphere three days ago. And now I'm sitting at my house posting on, on the internet, drinking, you know, your, your warm coffee at the house or, or whatnot. And, and I knew exactly what he meant by that, of how you can be so deeply immersed into truly almost wilderness and just wild. And then all of a sudden you're just not in that anymore. And, it, and it's something that I've definitely since then i've always craved it but i just i just am yearning for more of it like i would go to kodiak tomorrow if i could again <laughs> my body might not want me to but i would i would just eat it up again and again and again it's definitely something that was, makes me want to keep going back even if it's for deer or for waterfowl or for just anything yeah it's it's such an amazing feeling to be in such close range with areas of such consequence and mm. to appreciate that. And, and it maybe you don't even have to be like maybe necessarily there, but if you can see it from there, like I am on the edge here and this is something else. It's just such a great wild feeling. And I don't know, it's just like throughout human history, there's always been that fascination. Like rites of passage used to be where you go and you immerse yourself in these wild places. That's where you find out who you are. That's where you, you get you, you, you develop, you grow, you, you know, you become who you're supposed to be and you figure out things about yourself that you wouldn't be able to have revealed to you if you were living in, in the city or something, or civilization. So it's such a great thing to be able to go and experience. And we have so many readily available things to us as hunters where it's, oh, it's amazing experience and just getting out there. And it is, but it's impossible to really put that, that feeling down. And for people who don't really understand it, it's, it's impossible to get them to understand. It's impossible to forget, to get them to truly understand what that's like. No, absolutely. And especially I've noticed that even more so for coming to Alaska too, you know, I, when I, when I, I'd elk hunt, but I'd be 45 minutes from my house, you know, I'd hardly tent tent camp when I was elk hunting, but I was still in the elk woods bumping into other guys and, you know, I'd still long for it, but there's just something different about being dropped off in a float plane on a lake in the middle of Alaska, climbing up a mountain, being fortunate enough to even see goats, let alone, you know, tag one and then break it down. We rendered down the fat, fried up the heart, you know, frying up some back strap and render down fat as we're working on it. You know, that just the whole experience itself. Like I crave that now I crave elk hunting for sure. But like, just there's a whole nother level to it that I, I don't know not really way that I can put it into words. And, and I guess guys that are listening to this, that have got to do a big mountain hunt like that in Alaska might, might kind of understand what, what we're talking about, but just something completely different that I wouldn't have understood even a month ago. Mm-hmm. So day one, you get it done. The days in between where you just, uh, we got house, we're, we're dealing with house money right now. Is there a sense of urgency to get another one? Was there any, yep. it doesn't sound like there's any sort of temptation to, to, <laughs> to cut it off early. Cause you were wet. What were those middle days like? Uh, socked in with uh, fog, <laughs> <laughs> lots of fog and intermittent fog. We, you know, next day we open we open up the tent. We could see forty yards, and motivation was low. But we still, you know, we're we're talking to each other, and it's just like 
when's the next time you're going to get to do this? You can, you can sit in the tent with fog all you want, but you know, let's at least go try, you know, last thing you want to do is, is say you didn't leave it all up on the mountain. You didn't leave it all there trying to make the most out of the last little bit. And we were still into goats. You know, I had, I had opportunities the second day to, to notch my tag on, on multiple nannies and one potential Billy that the guys with me were swore was a Billy, but I, I just, I wasn't confident enough to know that it was, it was a little bit smaller bodied. If it was, it was a young Billy and, you know, had a couple more days still to hunt. We were actually only on top of the mountain, I think for three, three and a half days. Um, we, we called a little early because we saw that snow was moving in and we knew that we had trips back down the mountain still and back up and it was the tough, tough trips. And so we called it just a little bit early plan to get down and maybe go do some deer hunting, but we, we left it up there as much as we could as, as far as goats were concerned. We, we went further than we did that first day. We didn't just go 400 yards, shoot a goat, and not hunt anymore. The rest of the hunt, we went to different drainages as best we could. You can't, it's hard to be mobile up there when everything's so steep and you're popping in and out of fog and you're wanting to make sure that you're not about to go over the side of a cliff. Um, but we were in the goats. I mean, we were just bumping goats here and there. You know, they, they go 300 yards. We try to get a better spot to look at them. So we put a lot of eyes on a lot of goats and the, it was just, it was, it was cool. We just never ended up connecting with the Billy, but just hunt hard those next two days to really foggy. We were, we were battling a little bit of weather as far as rain and snow. Um, you know, just battling being wet from the night before. Cause we were breaking down that goat that first night and that, and that storm just boom was on us. We didn't even have time to put rain gear on. So we got wet the first day and stayed wet the rest of the trip. Yikes. When you were going through the fog, you said that you were bumping mountain goats. Was there any concern with, brown bears because you'd seen them before you're worried about uh bumping one of those so i was actually talking to a guy today at work about that uh was like it's definitely on the back of your mind but you almost forget until all of a sudden boom there's a brown bear 350 yards away from you working up towards Mm -hmm. your kill you know or just you you bump over and i I thought i I didn't know i thought i saw a wolverine or something i'm like what what the heck is that you see a brown bear just booking it because he just caught your wind and you know you definitely would think that kodiak island i'm definitely gonna have that sense of awareness but we were more dialed into let's go find goats let's go find goats and then it wouldn't surprise you but it would take you by surprise when you're like oh yeah we still gotta look for those Mm mm-hmm that's crazy. When you did see them, were they? What do they appear to be doing? Did they, did they like not really care? Could they not see you? Were they kind of clocking you and staying aware or uh, staying away? What was the? What was their their temperature? Yeah, yeah. These bears did not want to be around us. That's for sure. You know, day one when we were at base camp, we we pulled out some targets just to make sure our zeros were still on. Nothing got bumped, and um, two three minutes after we pulled our targets we see a brown bear working down the opposite bank coming towards us. I don't know if he was chase, chasing shots or whatnot, but as soon as he got to the spot where we were at, we're setting targets. You just saw his nose go up in the air. He caught scent and man, he like a bat out of hell. He was just gone. And that was kind of the consensus for all the bears that we were relatively close to. Um, I think the bears in the area that we go to get hunted and they get shot at mm. and they do not like being around humans. Um, I think the reason that we were seeing the bears up top is because we did have a fresh kill. Um, the the last day we were up there, there was a brown bear that had buried my carcass and was laying on it. You know, um, there's foxes. He, he, we watched him run off a fox and stuff. Um, but just buried the kill was almost burying himself with it. Um, I think that was a big reason why they were up there. You know, we might've seen the same bear three days, um, three or four days. I think we saw four bears up in the Alpine. So it might've been the same bear, but it definitely, when it would catch our wind, you'd see that nose up and it was, it didn't want to be anywhere near us. Mm. That's nice. You, you tend to hear that sort of description with uh, black bears. So it's nice mm-hmm. that, uh, that brown bears have that same sort of instinct either through stories yeah, like or said, just I the worst the case. Ones got shot. Yeah. The worst case scenario is always, well, black bears will, they'll run away, but brown bear, brown bears are more antagonistic and they'll get after you. But that's not always the case. You don't always have to be paranoid, but at the same time, you have to have a different level of awareness when you're around them. No, absolutely. It's, they were still definitely concerned when we were when we were sleeping. 
you know, the 10 mils were all in, they were in our tent, like <laughs> still rocked and ready to go just in case we were discussing like, Hey, if I get pulled, if I'm getting dragged out, just shoot through me. I don't even care. You're either going to end my suffering quicker or you're going to get the brown bear. So, you know, there's jokes about that. Of, oh, when the brown bear comes to get me. So we definitely still had a, an alertness and we were looking for them, but whenever they did pop up, you're like, Oh crap. I almost forgot that we have to look for these things. Yeah. That dark humor is like a lot of professions have that, you know, firefighters talk mm -hmm. about it and, you know, in military talk about it and, you know, hunters talk about that too. Not to say that hunters are in the same caliber, but you know, it's that same way that you're coping with something that could be potentially stressful is, you know, Hey, you know, and then when this happens, do this, I hope it doesn't happen. I'm concerned about this. I don't want a story. I want a nice, just easy, boring, if anything, cause it's going to be an amazing experience anyway. I really don't want a survival story. Yeah. Yeah, no, we, we, we joked about that too. Cause we did bring the one guy does have, does have some climbing gear that he brought up and he says, I'm leaving this at base camp because we are not going to use this. He's like, I don't want to have a story of me dangling the, the smallest <laughs> guy off the edge of the ledge, trying to, trying to break down a goat and, and bring it up with paracord or anything like that. So uh, we definitely had that like, we're prepared, but we want this to be the most, you know, not boring, but the most boring hunt story ever. We walked up, we shot it, we went, we went home. <laughs> yeah. That whole full send is sometimes an excuse to be stupid. So I'm not, a, I'm not a huge fan of that. Um, yeah. 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 Um, challenging yourself and getting after it um, and embracing the suck and all those sort of things are good, but uh, there, you, you still got to not be an idiot. No, absolutely. And up there, you know, we've got our in reaches and stuff to, to get a hold of um, medical service if needed. But I mean, they're still minimum, minimum an hour out at least. That's if they can get together and out quick. And even if they can get to you, because we actually got pulled out. Um, we we radioed or we, we texted in reaches to kind of see, hey, could we get like a two hour pickup earlier than we had planned so we can make our connecting flight because we had flight the same day. And they actually responded back. You're not getting out tomorrow. You've, you've got, we can get you out in the next three hours. Otherwise you're stuck for the next three days. Hindsight, I probably should have just said, okay, we'll just try to get us tomorrow. Cause now I'd have had three more days. We could have went up. We could have tried to kill that Billy, but we got pulled out a, uh, almost a full day early just because weather, um, they were expecting really bad wind again. And, um, when they picked us up, they almost weren't able to come get us. And I, now I know why we're sitting there in that little float plane and you drop um, it feels like a thousand feet when when you hit a little bit of turbulence it doesn't feel like a big jet and your stomach just drops it's it's like disneyland but not fun yeah yeah i hated taking those for basketball trips in southeast alaska like january and february that's when we were traveling taking those tiny things all around it's awful so yeah. awful so i don't have the same um when people talk about, oh, I took this nice little float plane. It was amazing. Like, yeah, do that in January. Tell me how fun it is. Yeah. Um, no. So, it did, uh, so what, uh, when you got back, how did you, like, get the meat prepared to take back? How did that all go? Uh, like when we got back to Spike Camp? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we actually ended up doing, like, a little tripod system with our um, trekking poles. And just hung them in the meat in the meat sacks there, trying to keep it to where some airflow could could um, could uh, we could keep airflow so nothing would get stale or anything. And then we actually ended up. My buddy had he bought one of those new or new to him Kuyu tents, and we actually ended up pulling the tent body out and just left the the fly with the frame up. And we ended up putting all of our gear that we wanted to hang up. We we built like a little grate with our trekking poles to keep the meat elevated off the ground for those few days. It actually worked really well our gear would somewhat dry out when we put it in there. If we were near camp and the sun poked out, one guy would run back to camp and, and drape everything out over the tent so we could have some somewhat dry socks, and rotate our, our clothing and stuff. But um, meat, uh, it was, it was a concern more for the bears than spoilage. Cause it right. was just, it was just cold enough. Um, yeah. We got good airflow on it and, and kept it dry. And then when you uh, took it back, did you have uh, like a cooler that you uh, put it in for the, for the flight? Uh, we hung it up in a, we just hung it up in a tree, um, at base camp. Um, then when we ended up going, we cut that down and we just put it into totes. Uh, we had those, uh, minute, 
uh, Rubbermaid uh, yeah, yeah. action packers is what we were putting those in. And um, when we got back to the town of Kodiak, we asked the, the air service that we were with, who was kind of like catering us and taking us to the hotel we needed to get to. And we just asked them which hotels had uh, freezers and took us to one. They said that they don't have a freezer that they usually use, but their, their diner area was being – uh, remodeled and didn't have any food in their freezer, so they let us go and put uh, put the goat in the in the freezer, and uh, we dealt with all the meat and that and the hide there, and uh, spent that last little bit in Kodiak, and then next day got on with the goat completely frozen in those action packers, put it on the plane, and back to Juno. Dang, that is perfect. That, there's so many stories out. of stories that are like that where local people are just helping out strangers and it's not even exclusive to alaska i'm not saying that this is like oh alaska is way better than everybody else because people are friendly but it's so <laughs> no so nice to see people who are just willing to help others and it's a request that you know you could say no to it'd be easy to say no no oh, it's, this is for food you know this is a restaurant i mean who cares if we're redoing the dining room or whatever you can't do that okay i understand but you know just being willing oh, and yeah. being helpful for other people it's just such a nice thing and i do think it is maybe more common in Alaska because at some point it's going to be you that needs something It's something as simple as a place to, um, put some, some meat to freeze or, you know, if, if something breaks around the house, but you're getting through winters together. And so just mm -hmm. putting out in the universe that you are a kind person and hoping that it, you know, resonates. And when it's your turn to ask for help, someone will be available to you. I noticed that even more so when I went to went to Cold Bay last year. Is they're super super small. I mean, residential. I think like forty people uh, year round or something like that. But like the lodge was just talking about. Oh yeah, we got to run over to so and so's and drop off this this tool because they need it. And you know, not really a hardware store for them to go to. So definitely, I'd say rural Alaska definitely has the you help me, I help you, just because we're all in the same boat together. And Kodiak definitely had that. Um, they didn't need to let us use that that freezer like that. She actually even went and let us use their their scale so we could make sure that our baggage was all under 50 pounds so nice. we wouldn't get checked more for baggage. And just super hospitable. And, you know, everyone in Kodiak just was super nice. We went to a pizza place, super nice. I, I think I think Alaska has that maybe more so than other places, like you are saying, um, but rural Alaska, just a sense of camaraderie and, hey, we're all we're all in this together. Yeah. It's funny because, and maybe a little bit ironic that you have this level of independence because of where you live and because, you know, you're self-sufficient, you can do all these things by yourself, but at the same time, and understanding that you can become dependent very, very quickly. Oh, ab absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So, uh, you getting home, like, did it go too quick for you? Like on the flight, like it's already over. Man, I, I, I did that, and it it's done, and now I'm going back? Or were you so excited for a hot, warm shower that uh, you're like, ah, it's good. Let's move on. So a little bit of that, need that hot, warm shower at, at, at first. You know, as we were sitting there waiting for that float plane to come get us, it kind of hit us as soon as we heard that plane come in. We were sitting there playing around with a little fishing rod. Uh, there were so many reds running in that lake that we were at, and so we're like, we're just out of base camp there was a crick coming out and there was reds running in it and we just threw on a little pattern that looked like it had a little bead on it just to maybe try to catch some dollies so we caught these nice real beautiful spawning dollies we even caught a silver and we're just kind of taking in the moments while it, while it lasts and i was catching what like my second or third fish and all of a sudden the plane's just here and then as soon as you heard that plane it was just like this is over. We don't want this to be over. It's, it's over a day earlier than we were planning to begin with. And it was just, you're almost wanting to be selfish and, and tell them to leave. Don't, don't pull me from this. I want to stay here. But then we got back to Kodiak. Um, and we, I mean, we all took like an hour shower each. <laughs> it was just, we didn't realize how bad we stunk until yeah. all our, our gear was in the, in the hotel room, our packs you know, we were in kind of wet, bloodyish clothes from from processing and then hiking in, and where you you don't realize how 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 not good you smelt and, until yeah. you walk in. You can just smell that musk. You're like, oh, this is gross. We we just need to go back out so that we don't smell this anymore. And we're sitting there and, and eating our pizza in, in that little pizza joint, and we were discussing of how 
how short this really was. We were gone from Juno for a week, but how short the trip itself of getting on a float plane, going and hunting, getting back on a plane and leaving, it felt like a day and a half. Hmm. And we definitely want to make it a longer trip next time just to be able to enjoy a little bit more. I know that a one or two more days, we probably would have been hitting that point of, all right, I'm ready to get home, see my wife, take a nice cold or warm shower um, and all that. But definitely felt short, felt almost robbed a little bit, leaving a little early. Yeah. It's nice to be able to have those experiences so readily available in the short amount of time that you've been in Alaska. You've done the grizzly bear and did uh, uh, emperor goose geese. Um, but you have those opportunities and it's not like a once in a lifetime thing. And it's not a once every five year type thing. Like you can stack these things up. You can have an epic experience every year, every season, because something is going to be over the counter and it's not a matter of being super wealthy. Like you can afford these sort of things. And it's, it's so nice to the things that shook out in such a way that my parents moved up to Alaska when I was five. And so I was just kind of planted here and you grow up in the area and you grow up with kind of these experiences and, and that confidence to be able to make stuff happen. And I'm sure, you know, you were the same. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't Alaska, but just people who value the outdoors and getting in with those people. And then it just makes those opportunities so much more prevalent going forward. And you look for them and you know what to look for. And you know that you can make those happen. You're confident to make that happen. And it's not just once when you're older, it's every year, at least one, if possible. Absolutely. So I've actually got a question for you about that. Do you think that we take that for granted when it's too readily available? Or do you think, do you think it, I mean, personally to you, do you, do you feel like you still cherish it just as much as if it was a once in a lifetime experience? Uh, I think we have to have reminders. I think the, if you built into your schedule or like your circle of friends, people that are going to help you not feel like egotistical or, you know, someone that's going to just feed your ego. Cause Oh my gosh, you're a rugged Alaskan person. Just like someone who makes you remember to be humble and what you have and what you can experience and that you shouldn't waste it. Um, yeah. not those, those yes, men or those whoever people that, that just around you and tell you how great you are. But you know, if you have enough of those people, I don't think it's, I think you still probably can take it for granted, but I think you may be less apt to take it for granted or more likely to recognize when you start to take it for granted and then appreciate it more. Yeah. I found myself trying to not take things for granted as I'm up here. Cause I, I realized that Alaska probably isn't uh, you know, a forever thing. And I, it's just like when I'm complaining that I, that I'm going salmon fishing after work and I didn't catch one. It's like, darn it. I didn't catch one. I saw him, I saw him jump and I saw other guys catch one, but I didn't catch one. And then on the drive home, I'm like, what am I sitting here complaining about? I just got off of work. I've got a fly rod in my hand. I'm waist deep in, in, in salt water fishing for salmon. When did I ever think I'd ever be doing that after a day of work? Yeah. You know? And so I've tried to keep that little bit of humility as I've been up here and just almost take every experience, every every trip, every hunt, as if it is the only time I'll ever get to do it. And yeah. that's kind of helped me keep a perspective on that. Yeah. This last weekend on Saturday, it was super nice. And so my uh, wife and I, we went out in the boat and I had rented a forest service cabin and it was pretty lumpy getting there because we had some, some exposed water and it was rollers. We hit them, hit them head on. So it wasn't so bad, but you know, you're rolling with it and you beat up a little bit. And so we pulled into that spot and the forest service cabin didn't have a mooring buoy and there was just enough wind to make me really nervous about uh, anchoring overnight and, and the that little bay just pretty much drained at low tide so i thought gosh dang it like i had planned it we're getting we're getting more remote to a spot that's pretty exposed and so i'm sure not a lot of hunters get there it's rut the last weekend of october is always when i really really get excited i always see bucks i've taken a lot of my bucks around this sort of time and then not be able to do that I was irritated and then I thought we have to go back home and we have to leave fairly soon because it's a long run back home. But that day was pretty easy to kind of say, this is, that was sweet. I've always wanted to kind of make this run and, and we did it and it was a beautiful day. So you know what? It's okay. You got to do an epic boat trip. And then the next day, uh, Sunday, 
we went to a spot and it was it was pretty close to where i wanted to be anchored up hiked around didn't even see a doe and reel back to the boat pull the anchor start going home and i'm i'm I, I started to feel that sort of, gosh dang it, I'm the only person in Southeast Alaska who didn't get a buck this weekend. Everybody's getting bucks. Everybody's getting bucks. I'm getting texts from buddies who got bucks. And I was super irritated. But then, you know, just kind of going with the waves, beautiful day, weather was even nicer than the day before. And I thought, man, this is, this is, this is great. And it, I think part of it too is that I was sharing the experience with my wife. You know, if you do a solo yeah. hunt and it's not successful, then it's like, ah, man, what do you know? You kind of chastise yourself. But you, I've cheated the experience previously when I got too frustrated when Abby and I were out fishing and only got two or three or lost a couple. And it's mm -hmm. like, dude, you need to relax here. Like you're hunting with your with your wife. You, need, you need yeah. enjoy this. And so I think I'm getting much better at that. And that's kind of that reminder of. This is, this is great. You get to do this, man, and people would love to be able to do this. So do you think that's a sign of maturity, or do you think that's just you just developing as an outdoorsman? Uh, maybe both. Maybe, maybe also <laughs> when, when my wife looks at me or get, she gets sad or frustrated that I'm frustrated. Um, yeah. And I'm just like, oh, I get you that. moron. You're such an idiot. And it's, you know, she doesn't do anything to make me feel guilty or anything like that. I just... Uh, you just why? Well, come on, man. You can do. You can do better than this. Um, but it I've takes some time. Found myself doing very similar things. <sighs> with, not not gonna kill. Yeah, sorry, but like with my wife fishing with her, it's just like I know the fish are here. I know we can catch them, and I'm getting so frustrated because I can't get her on her first silver salmon or something. You know, it's just like, and she's just sitting there half the time of her life just fly fishing one of the for one of the first times. To her, it doesn't matter that she didn't get to have that. Like to me, I want her to have that experience so badly so she can feel what i've gotten to feel and i feel that you know i'm almost robbing her of that first experience trying too hard and and beating you know myself up about oh well i didn't get her on the 10 fish i wanted her to when in the meantime she's just like that was one of the funnest things i've ever done and in terms of success we weren't successful but it's i think it's all on how you how the, the person views what success is the success was is we were out together and beautiful southeast alaska just enjoying enjoying it yeah i had um like you have that pissy attitude and then if you, things end up working out it's like too bad that i ruined most of this experience yeah. with that bad attitude it's like oh well now yeah. i'm not enjoying the result of this i you know you finally catch the fish oh man it's not this relief and euphoria it's okay finally and that's not what yeah. you should be feeling in that moment mm-hmm Wow. I know that. I know that exactly what you mean there. Exactly what you mean. <laughs> so uh, you you've been back now. You've been uh, eating some of it. Uh, I'm assume how I'm assuming how how have you been uh, consuming that? Uh, trying to do it sparingly, but we just find that we want to use it for everything. We've got a lot of. We ended up processing it out. A lot of a lot of burger, um, you know, straps, and roasts, and stuff. So we've cooked up a roast. We've cooked up my wife almost marinated the entire back strap i was like no 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 we don't eat this all at once we need to do two little steaks every now and then with like some with some potatoes or something so we can keep enjoying this because man mountain goat is delicious mm -hmm. i absolutely love it i was talking to a guy who does a lot of goat hunting and he says it really just depends what time of year and if it's a billy or a nanny he says generally the billies do not taste as good and, and you hear that with, with everything you know uh, a buck doesn't taste as good as as the doe, and and in some things I'd say that's probably true, and in others I think it's just someone thinking, you know, mind over matter, and their mind says that it's that's not as good. But uh, fantastic, I would loving it, eating it. You know, I think my wife's actually cooking some up tonight. I think she's doing another roast in the crock pot. Excellent. Um, she thinks it tastes like a really fresh, like homegrown beef. Um, I told her never to tell anyone that ever again because it does not taste <laughs> like beef. Um, but it's it's it, you, you would you'd assume that it wouldn't taste good because it's, it's a goat, you know. You'd think it's you know muttony taste, you know, old, really muscly, but it's it's really tender. There was so much fat on that animal when mm. we were breaking it down too, like almost fat that just wasn't attached to anything, just kind of like floating around there in the body cavity, not attached to anything. They just packed on so much 
so much fat and usually I trim a ton of fat off of my elk and stuff where they're usually pretty lean. We just keep them really lean. But with this, I mean, we left the chunks of fat on the steaks and that fat is definitely flavor and have to uh, find ourselves uh, not pulling steaks out too often. I, we've already eaten through a lot more than I wanted to. I kind of want to eat this sparingly so I can enjoy it for a little while longer. Almost yeah. wish I would have shot another, another nanny just, <laughs> just for some more meat. Yeah, I, I was amazed when I walked up on – I was I was invited on a hunt. It's just like a meat packer, and it was great to just see everything, you know, see what those two guys were looking at when it came to looking for a billy and, and what attributes. And I just wanted to learn, kind of absorb stuff. And we walked up on the on the goat that he'd shot, just the hooves uh, up close, and then the, the hide being so thick and big, and then just the fat and the bones. Like everything about it was just – it's just cool to see just the the individuality of that animal. You know, not every carcass is the same. It's not a matter of, oh, here's meat and bones. It's like, no, every, it's just so different, so wild and so special. No, oh, absolutely. And, and you know, it, it's, it's so similar to breaking down a deer, but then, like, when you're getting down to it, it's just like, wow, this is not a deer at all. Like, this is a mountain goat. You can see, you know, as you're, as you're skinning the hide off, just the, the muscle and the fat. And just the posture, you know, you see how they're, how they're standing, you know, they're, that's how they're built. Like they're not hunched over. That's just, that's just their anatomy. And they're just the, you see the country that they're in and you look at those hooves and you, you see how beat up they are. You know, wh- one of them, one of the hooves on mine was actually chipped really bad. You know, it's like, man, that, that thing's has to climb these rocks. And it was a different sort of respect for me. You, you know, you always see deer milling around and, you know, you think mountain goats, yeah, they're sure they're on top of the mountains, but you actually see where they're living yeah. and thriving. And it's just like, this is so wild. And maybe, maybe that's why I think it tastes so good is because you work so hard for it. <laughs> but even down here, uh, after the fact, I still think it tastes pretty good. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, those things live in some unbelievably wild country. And it's funny that, that they're white and that contrast it makes them so easy to see but those big old billies that are in that in that stuff it doesn't matter it's like yeah i know you can see me i'm not trying to hide myself what are you going to do about me being here you're going to do nothing cuz well, you can't get here these goats were not wary at all <laughs> that's crazy it's just like you know once you got close they they peek up like oh wow you're you're a little closer but i mean we were anywhere from five to 700 yards away and they just look at you Hmm. you obviously we're trying to stay low we're trying not to get skylined you know still trying to hunt them but like normally you know a deer sees you at three four five hundred yards they're probably gonna bust you yeah they're they're, you know they're gonna bump over but you know we're we're shooting i shot shot this goat and two more goats kind of like poke out and like oh hey what's going on you know could could have filled my tag on another goat right then and there um, and it's just, I don't think they've really got a care in the world other than don't fall off. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Awesome. What, uh, what else you got for the winter? What do you have heading into the winter? Uh, hopefully some sea ducks here soon. Nice. Definitely what we're going to try to do is I got a buddy coming up, my first hunting buddy from lower 48 coming up, I think in two weeks. And uh, we're going to go out and try to get him on some some birds that'll be once in a lifetime for him try to get on some harlequins and some scoters and stuff and just just enjoy some friendship coming up here that's been something that i definitely think that's been missing since me and my wife moved up here is just some normalcy with people that we know Mm. coming up so it'll be nice to have him come up so really uh probably try to go for some deer i've I've debated if i want to put a brown bear tag in my pocket maybe go try to get a fall fall brown bear but haven't really talked myself into that one yet but Probably deer and then just a lot of waterfowl. Get as much waterfowl season soaked up um, with these with these cold cold fronts coming in and some more birds moving in. Nice full plumed and beautiful birds and try to try to shoot some more. That's kind of planned so far. Yeah, there's. I definitely want to deer hunt more than I want to duck hunt, but I definitely want to duck hunt. So there's a little bit more sense of urgency. I want to take care of at least one more deer so that I can duck hunt. It's so much fun. It's yeah. just, it's so oh, different. Man. Again, it's like, why would you choose ducks over deer? And it's like, I'm not choosing ducks over deer. It's, it's just a fun experience. You sit there and you're drinking coffee and you're trying to call some in. You're hanging out by the decoys. Just a great, fun experience. It's different from that super quiet, super still 
hunting of, of deer and it's just it's fun yeah and i think when you're talking about comparing it's it's definitely apples to oranges they're both fruit but two different two different things and you yeah. can enjoy them both differently um you know i i definitely you know you 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 wait for deer season to open you know you count down the days and then like you do the, i do the same thing with duck season but with duck season it's like i still get excited every morning i go out because like oh what's gonna be flying today you know is it gonna be a good day what what species are we gonna yeah. maybe be shooting today? It, it's it's a it's a new hunt every day, and I think that's what really gives me the allure to the waterfowl. Yeah, um, not that it's more so than the big game. The big game's like you get you get the crap beat out of you for four days, and you don't see a deer. It's kind of tough to want to go the fifth day. Yeah, for sure. Man. Well, where can people uh, find you? Did you save your Instagram story so if they go to your uh, Instagram, they can watch that whole thing? Yeah, so I haven't put together um, that little highlight reel. I think that's what they call it. It's the, the story highlights. Uh-huh. Um, that's actually something I was hoping to do in the next couple of days, kind of add some. And I'm actually going to post some more up there. Um, I've got just quite a few pictures of just, just the scenery and, and just, yeah. So I'll, I'll be putting those on my Instagram, which you, you kind of uh, mentioned at the beginning. Uh, my, my handle is the Bearded Huntsman. Um, I'm on Instagram. I don't really do too much on anything else, so there if you guys want to see any anything about that and i got my my goat posted up there probably update those highlights and hopefully let some people live a little bit through me that might not ever get to head to kodiak it's i don't think the pictures do it justice but it's still (laughs) they're still beautiful yeah well awesome man thanks again for being on here always great to talk to you uh congratulations and enjoy uh your slow enjoyment of the i just said enjoy the enjoyment what the heck is wrong with me (laughs) long day teaching too much lecturing today Uh, i guess but uh thanks again man appreciate it and uh take care all right thanks have a good one see you